So what we're going to do this evening is have a little uh, introduction into uh, research. Um, research is an area where I think people fear a lot about research and people get themselves quite twisted and turned over what they should or shouldn't know about research. Um, so I'm hopefully going to um, give you a little intro and a little bit of a, a snippet to that. Um, a little bit about myself, for, for those who don't know me, uh, my name's obviously Andy Thomas. Uh, I work as a senior paramedic on the bank with North East Ambulance Service, uh, and I work on their critical care ambulance response units. I also chair the local basic schemes within the North East, uh, and I am the chair for the paramedic advisory group for the faculty of pre hospital care. Um, I have a few Twitter handles that I'm involved in. Firstly, my personal one's Andy Thomas 135 um, obviously, I've got my basics ambulance northeast one, and uh, there's also Cipher MC, which is is, is my company uh, Twitter account. Um, for this evening, if you want to tweet anything or any questions, I'll monitor my uh, Andy Thomas Twitter account. Uh, should you have anything that you wish to uh, tweet through, and I'll try and get a response as we're going. So, what we're going to cover this evening? It's going to be about 30 minutes, um, and then I'll open it up to questions. What we're not going to do tonight is make anybody uh, research experts. I'm certainly no research expert. Um, I did spend uh, two years until eight months ago as a research fellow at James Cook University Hospital in uh, Middlesbrough. Um, so I, I've had a little taste of research. I have some work published, um, and I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview. So the scope of the thing, we're going to have a look at how research is defined, and that's, that can be quite subjective, to be honest. Uh, we're going to develop some basic understanding of the underpinning uh, philosophical approach to research. We'll have a little look at the research cycle. We'll talk a little bit about quals and quantitative evidence and how they compare and where they stand. And we'll maybe have a chance at the end to have a quick look at the hierarchy of evidence. So how is research divine, defined? Um, there's the dictionary version, as you can see. I'm not going to necessarily read these out because you're obviously reading them on the screen yourself. Um, and it, it can be defined in a multiple of ways. Obviously, it, it tends to be a systematic process. It does involve some form of data collection and analysis, um, and it's designed to it, it increase our understanding of the world around us. Um, it doesn't matter what philosophical approach you take to research uh, that underpins your research paradigm, or whether it's qualitative or quantitative research, the fundamentals are the same, that we are collecting data we find ways of analysing that and we're trying to create new understanding. The, um, another method or another way of thinking about it is, is simply to learn something new in a scientific and methodical manner. And that's what we're going to have a basic look around. So when we're looking at research as an overall concept, um, research fits into what we call the research cycle. Um, and first of all, we must identify some kind of research problem um, or an area where we think is lacking in evidence, um, and that often creates um, an area where research will develop from. But it's quite important when, when thinking about areas of research that we've not developed into, um, not just to go plowing in there and crack straight on with some kind of research proposal, spend a lot of time, effort, and potentially money in trying to find a solution to something that may already be out there. In any good research area, or to understand research truly what is needed, we must do a very systematic lit literature review first to understand what research has been conducted and what out there is already. For example, if I wanted to find out, and I may use this example a few times, which is probably not the best, if I should use a cervical collar or not, then I would go and look at the literature around the cervical collar use and decide does more research need to be made or as the research that exists already answered my question. If after doing an extensive review or literature search, it would then take us through our next step of the research cycle, which would be a research question. This is where we provide aims and a hypothesis, for example, if it is a quantitative and numbers-based research. Um, in qualitative research, this may be a way of finding an answer to a question that can't be defined in, in the traditional scientific manner. Um, this process can be quite difficult. It often involves quite a lot of uh, rewrites and rewording of it because the correct research question and having the correct aims will fundamentally define the research early door, uh, how it succeeds. 
Um, there's many design methods, and design methodology is a term you often see within uh, research. Um, and methodology is just a word that is a simple way of defining how we're going to conduct, collect, and design that research. Um, there's many different designs, both in qualitative and quantitative research, um, and, you, and many of them have plus points and minus points depending on what you're going to do. If you're a novice researcher, which most people I suspect will be novice researchers who are tuning in tonight because this is a simple intro, then this is when you take advice from other people. You come up with an, the idea or the question in your head, you've, you've done a little bit of a relative review and you take advice on what methodology would best find the solution to your problem. Sampling or samples is often talked about in research and for those novice researchers out there, you often hear how sampling is conducted is a very critical way that people review how the validity of research is or the trustworthiness of research if it's uh, quanti uh, qualitative research for example. So sampling is really keen. We in quantitative research and qualitative to a certain extent we're trying, well more quantitative sorry, we're trying to get an understanding of how that this results we're going to find can be representative of the wider population. So if we are trying to investigate whether a dressing uh, heals a wound quicker, there would be no point just getting people into the research study who are females who are 20 and have no comorbidities. Because any results that would come out of that would be purely specific to that research group and would not be representative of the population. So you must get a good sample, and that's why they use, uh, there's many different uh, methods of uh, sampling, but often randomized is a word you'll hear, hear a lot, and these, this comes in randomized controlled trials and, and other such research. The numbers involved in the research are quite significant as well. If you're doing a piece of research that may have impact to the wider population, for example, the population of the UK, 55 to 60 million people, then the research sample size has to be of a significant value to ensure that that is a representative proportion. So if you, for example, the recent paramedic trial, which looked at mechanical CPR, um, if they'd have only sampled 100 patients, uh, the results would have never been thought of as being particularly valid. That might have been a nice interesting pilot study, but it wouldn't have been a study that would have been able to give any power to the research. Um, because I, I, that would have need to be a much not larger piece of research and we're talking about the thousands uh, for example in that study. And within that methodology we must collect our data correctly. Um, in quantitative research that sometimes can be a bit more simpler because that could be blood values, uh, measurements, uh, and it's often hard in fact data collection for want of a better word. In quant uh, qualitative research that may, may be opinions, feelings, thoughts and that gets analysed differently. The research cycle then needs robust data analysis, anal, an, analysing um, and again depending on the methodology used depending on what you use there is some significant software packages out there that will support and allow you to do the research, put the numbers in and get the information back. I personally always suggest at this stage having an independent statistician involved certainly for quantitative research um, and that will help make sure that you are getting the results that are correct and there's no bias and also to be honest data analysis is quite a specialist area and uh, although I'm reasonably good at doing a little bit of data analysis once it starts getting complex and logarithmic for want of a better word it can be very complicated. We're then going to come up with some results and findings. There's no point doing a research project getting some findings whether they be proving your hypothesis or not and not sharing that with other people. And that's when it's important to invest in the write-up, get published, and make sure that, that those findings can benefit the wider community, and, and then that will become part of the known literature. What research isn't? It's not a clinical audit cycle. Clinical audit's about setting standards, uh, quality improvement, change management, um, getting processes in place, and checking against a defined target that we're meeting that audit cycle. And that sometimes, I think research often gets confused with clinical audit. Um, although audit is a, could be argued to be a low level of research, it's certainly not true research in itself. And therefore, when we're looking at research, we must remember it's not clinical audit. Clinical audit has a great deal of value in clinical practice. Um, it's often born from meeting standards against the evidence base, but it's not research. You just don't get them confused.
you often hear about evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine and within your clinical practice no matter what sphere that is at the moment um, I'm sure you apply evidence-based practice to your daily treatment of patients your daily care um, and there's a difference between research process and the evidence-based practice process I talked a little bit about before in the research cycle about when you've got your results it's important to disseminate your findings and, and that, that is very true. If you look at this modified research process on the right hand side and how it feels into the evidence based process, trying to find whether you should change your practice, what's the best evidence, what's the best treatment for a patient is born out of a simple question. When we then go off to do the literature search to see whether we need to take that process into research or the answers are already available, this is when we'd find the answers from research. So that could be as, as simple as. Um, given oxygen to a trauma patient. We would review the, the literature out there and if the literature is strong, there's plenty of it, and if the suggestion is that's good in trauma patients, then we would um, we would bring that into our evidence-based findings, we'd appraise the literature, we'd critically analyze it, we'd decide whether that's valid, and then we'd apply and analyze change from there. So the final cycle of research fits in firmly into that evidence-based process. And where before I said clinical order is not necessarily uh, research, I think research and evidence-based practice, those processes, as you can see on the screen, are very interlinked. Um, and we can save ourselves a lot of time when we're investigating what we should do from the evidence base if we systematically review the literature correctly and find there's an answer. What we don't want to do, is, as I said before, is spend a lot of time and money on research that already exists. So a good literature search is key for answering any questions and in a lot of occasions you'll come up with a thought process you'll think ah oh, there's something lacking in research there but when you do a systematic search of the databases and the literature you'll probably find the answer. I've thrown around a bit of uh, terminology and I said I'd talk a little bit about the philosophical underpinnings of research and there's two main ways of thinking when it comes to research. There's the positive approach, which is a, a fundamental belief in objective reality, um, and this kind of research is based on hard measurement, cause and effect, relationship building. And this research methodology is then referred to as quantitative research, but it has that positivist under, underpinning from its philo philosophical uh, background within the positivist uh, environment. On the other side of the coin we have the interpretivism or the naturalistic approach uh, and this is a reality of construction. This is where people interpret things differently um, from their own experience of a phenomenon for want of a better word and people's uh, understanding and interpretations of that reality can vary from, from one person to another and this research methodology is what methodolo methodology is more of the qualitative research. To put another way, and please don't think I'm stereotyping people here, but in the traditional sense, from a hospital-based setting, quantitative research is, is, is traditionally thought as what doctors do, and qualitative research is traditionally thought of what um, the nursing community do. But if you're a hard and fast qualitative or quantitative research, people tend to bracket themselves into one camp or the other. I'm a firm believer that neither can be successful without the understanding of the other and true research to really find the solution to problems involves both and I'll touch on that a little bit more as we go on. Now, reality knowledge is very interesting and uh, when conducting research it is important to understand what the researcher is looking at, what their social reality is and how that will affect the individual researcher. By how they construe that environment um, they, and how what their approach underpinning philosophical approach is and how they see the world will make a difference to how that research is perceived and what research they will conduct. Uh, you've got ontology which is the nature of reality and its characteristics and then you've got the epistemology, uh, epistemology sorry, and this is about the way things uh, are known to be or it's how we assume things exist, more factual evidence. But people will throw terminology at you all the time in research and I think people get bogged down in it for simple terms guys. What I would recommend is when you're looking at research is, is it looking at hard and fact measurements or is it looking at how people perceive the world and those are two different types of research. 
Now, I would invite everybody um, to use the um, under the question button in your uh, GoToWebinar control panel now. Um, I'm just opening mine up. Uh, can you put full slides? Uh, put full slide sets. Uh, I think that's been changed. Um, I'm assuming everyone can still see my um, my slide there. Under questions, I'm going to ask you two questions, and feel free to respond under the questions section just to give me a flavour. So I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, what do you see on my screen now? To the right hand side of the question. It's not a trick question. Don't worry. And the other question is, what can it be used for? So what can you see on my screen now, which is an object? And what can you use it for? And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to ponder that and, uh, and answer for me, please. So what is it and what can you use it for? And I'd like people to participate using the GoToWebinar panel under questions and just throw some, throw some things out there. So I've got one response so far. We're doing well. So I've got, yeah. So I've got a hammer. I've got a claw hammer. I've got something to hit nails into wood. Yeah, another person a hammer for hammering objects. Uh, a hammer and a red cross, lots of white space. Yeah, ignore the red cross, that's just the logo, sorry, but yeah, well observed. So it's definitely the hammer I'm, I'm focusing on uh, to pull nails out of wood. Um, what else can the hammer be used for? Striking, interesting. Uh, please expand the person that's just put striking, Ian, if you don't mind. So what can the hammer be used for? That's I'm, I'm quite interested. So I'm getting some answers. Most of the answers at the moment are hitting towards this kind of use. A bit of DIY. The hammer's there to help us in the home to nail things in, pull things out, um, and stuff on. Now, the hammer might mean different things to different people. And when we talk about social construct and social reality and how people perceive research and the, the world around them, then the interpretation of the hammer can be quite interesting. Oh, I've got loads more here. Remove nails, uh, lever in. RAC man used hammer to knock a bit of my engine. Excellent, brilliant answer. I love that. Opening a bottle of beer, breaking glass. Yes, I'm, we're starting to get into it now. I like it. Hammer hitting nails, extricating nails, murdering people, and then laugh out loud. Um, don't worry, you're not getting reported to the police. That's the kind of answers I'm after. Vandalism and breaking. So really good answers there. Predominantly people thinking DIY. We've got one crazy murderer on the line, and that's really interesting. So how you perceive it. So my first slide here, as you can see, is a hammer being used for DIY. However, my second slide is a little bit more sinister. And, I'll, and I, I thank Michael for his, uh, his support there. He looked at it in a bigger picture, how people might perceive it. He found it hitting nails, removing things, but he also said it could be used for murder. It could be used as a weapon. It could be used in self-defense if you're suddenly attacked. The hammer in front of you has blood splats on it and around it. And how you perceive things can very much affect how you see the world around you. And also, that will affect how you approach research. I'm probably going a bit all uh, philosophical on you now, but it's really important. And tonight's effort is about really underpinning that philosophical approach. To put side by side, then the hammer is either DIY or it could be a murder or assault weapon, as we've, as we've alluded to there. And people would see that differently. So when it comes to some kind of research, which is non-quantitative, so the more qualitative research, people's understanding of research, people's interpretation of the experience they've had or the phenomenon will vary. And that's just something from a philosophical underpinning that I think is quite important to remember when we're looking at it. Now, in research, we like to use a lot of terminology. And to be honest, I like to keep it simple. So. I'm going to break it down into quantitative research and qualitative research, and I've put some bullet points on the screen to talk around. Remember, in simple terms, quantitative research is what they call traditional hard science. People seem to think numbers, measurements, and so on and so forth. And qualitative research is perceived as more the touchy-feely how people are feeling research. In fact, it's a bit more complicated than that. So quantitative research looks at concepts. It looks at different variables. And by looking at variables to define whether something works or changes, for example, drug A makes a diabetic patient less likely to be unwell or whatever the case may be, dressing A is better at healing wounds than dressing B, will control variables within the research and normally only change one factor to see if that variable makes a difference to the patient's care. And that's what we talk about when we're talking about variables in research. We're looking at relationships. 
Does doing X affect Y? Does giving adrenaline in a cardiac arrest A result in more ROSC rates and B result in more survivors to hospital discharge, which is what the Paramedic 2 trial is investigating? Within quantitative research, reality exists in one simple sense. It reality is what it is, the world is what it is. And what I mean by that is the people, the sky is blue, the grass is green. There is no subjectivity around that. They're just facts, and the world is built on facts and science. Within this research paradigm, quantitative research, the inquirer is normally independent, um, unless you're a drug company doing your own research. Um, and it's about being distanced from the research itself, putting the procedures in place, and looking at purely the results and the fact. Objectivity is sought, and it is often a deductive process by changing variables. It's based very much on measurements. When analysing whether something is effective, it's all about statistical analysis and whether it is statistically significant is a word. And that's when the P comes into things a lot, the p-value. We're not going to go into the p-value, but that's when you're reading them research papers and it says the, the p-value is less than 0 0.05. It means that research from the evidence gathered was statistically significant. You sometimes get quantitative research that is not statistically significant, but might be clinically significant to the patient group that was exposed to it. It's looking at generalizations and it's looking all about research validity. That's the term that is always used in quantitative research. What is the validity of this research? What were the processes used? What was the methodology used? Were the ran patients randomized correctly? Was the sample size correct? And that's how you prove validity. In qualitative research, as we've alluded to, is it's about studying a phenomenon and experience how we have perceived an event. It's very participant focused. So it's often related to interviews, to focus groups, and gathering verbal information from individual participants' feedback. It's looking at association, it's looking at links, it's looking at themes. Within this, the reali reality is subjective to the individual participant. Often within this research, the, uh, the, the researcher interacts. That might be by managing a focus group, by observing a society, or by conducting interviews to gain uh, data via answering questions and so on and so forth. It's an inductive process. It includes people. It's, it's, with this research, you can start off small, and sometimes, depending on the feedback you get from uh, the participants, this might open other areas of research and interest, and it might take you off down one path or the other. It's very narrative focused, so we end up with a lot of what they call uh, scripts. So these interviews and things are often recorded, then typed up, and then they're looking for themes and narrative information. It's uh, analyzed using qualitative analysis. It looks for seeking passing, pass, uh, patterns. So if they interviewed 30 participants, um, is there a pattern development within each participant towards the specific subject? And it's all about trustworthiness rather than valid validity. So is the researcher, have they been able to separate themselves enough from the research so that the opinion that's been presented is that of the participants and not that of the researcher themselves? And when you're analysing the quality of qualitative evidence, you very much look at the trustworthiness. So, that was a little uh, a snack. A snack, sorry, that was a little snapshot. I said snack because obviously the, uh, the two chocolate bars were coming up on the, uh, the, the screen there. So, He's going to conduct a bit of research. I, when, I, when I do this face-to-face, -face, I normally hand out chocolates. And I split the class into two, and I randomize them, and I get them to sample some chocolates. Obviously, unfortunately, um, Andy Omerod and CPD may have not yet, despite their platform being quite extensive and quite amazing, and there are lots of new features that you've seen coming online with Trauma Care and Real DX and other great things, they have not manage to figure out how to send chocolate bars or chocolates down the uh, internet yet. When they do, I will repeat this uh, lecture definitely. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to think of is two chocolate bars in your head. And I would normally randomize you, but again, this is quite difficult to do over the internet. And I want you to think of the benefits of A, a whisper bar, and B, a Mars bar. And which is truly the best chocolate bar? And how are we going to find out that? So feel free to answer openly again on the questions box. What do you prefer, a whisper 
or a Mars. It's going to it's going to divide opinion this evening on the on the uh, on the uh, from the delegates, I'm sure. So if you just want to answer under questions again, let me know what you fancy. So we're going. We've got the first two answers. Oh, Mars is going out strong at the moment. So Mars, I've got three for Mars. Come on, people, please answer. Whisper on Mars. Let's get a few answers in there under questions. Just type it in. What you prefer. I'll give you a few minutes to quickly type that up. So whisper on Mars. Please participate. So we seem to be overwhelmingly going towards Mars. So um, I'm going to pick somebody uh, at random. So don't worry, Andy, I don't need you to open their mic, uh, so don't panic if I say your name now. But Yasmin, thank you for your, your answer of Mars. Please tell us in a few words, and I'll read them out to the audience, uh, why Mars is a better chocolate bar than Whisper. So we're just waiting for Yasmin's answer there. Put her on the spot there. I do apologise, but you were first in with your answer. So I've got a couple of others. De depends on my mood. Uh, both. Whisper is infinitely, infinitely larger. Does that the uh, larger surface area of chocolate? So we're looking at a different. And then the answer from uh, Yasmin. Thank you. I find Mars a more fulfilling. Whisper is a bit airy. So when we're looking at some of the comments I've had on there, there's certainly uh, I like uh, Peter's answer. Thank you, Peter. Whisper has infinitely larger surface of area of chocolate. So. Pete has thought of this a little bit scientifically, and he thought, well, what's giving me more chocolate? Other people have gone, what it makes them feel like. Um, and and that, that is how, that's what conducts within different levels of research. Now, let's look at how we could have done this two different ways. We could have done it quantitatively. So I could have gotten the two chocolate bars, and I could have scientifically deconstructed them. So I could have which assessed which has the most chocolate on them, which lasts the longest, and how would you rate the taste out of five? That, that is a quantitative methodology, although using an opinion from a quantitative angle. So something like a qualitative angle, so they can be opinionated. I could have still done stuff like weigh the chocolate bars, measure the size and dimensions. And I might have said the one with more chocolate, which is a bigger size, is the better chocolate bar. However, like we just did there, under uh, the quick on the line, we've used a qualitative methodology. So what describes the, the chocolate taste? Describe the chocolate texture. Which would you prefer? And the answers people have said is, oh, I fancy Mars because this. Some people might like the bit of caramel you get in there. Um, I like the answer where somebody said it depends on my move. And that Angela, that was a really good answer. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, I, to be honest, I think after having rushed down there from teaching all day to come and, come and do this online, I could eat both of them right at the moment. So I wouldn't be too fussed. Um, but how you approach that is very different to what results you would get. If we measured them, I don't know which one measures better, but if we did it quantitatively, we'd have a winner. And that winner might be statistically or not statistically significant. We'd calculate, we'd conclude, and we'd publish. However, if we were asking people's opinions, how it makes them feel when they eat the chocolate bar, what does it taste like, and what is the texture like, that would be more qualitative. We'd be getting verbal answers like we've gotten this evening. Uh, it has, you know, it makes, it, I like the creamy texture. It makes me feel fuller after a Mars bar or whatever it may be. And that's a different type of research. And that's how, in medical research, we're looking at different things. So to put a more scientific spin on it, quantitative research can be used to tell us what's better for healing a wound. If I put dressing A on and sampled 1,000 people with the injury versus another 1,000 people with dressing B, which dressing performs better? And I will measure, measure time of healing, uh, recurrence of wound is, is my end points. And it might show me that dressing A heals the wound with, on average within 5.7 days, where dressing B takes 6.9 days. Over a large sample, that might be quite a statistically significant result and could have cost benefits, for example, patients need less outpatient appointments, patient might be discharged sooner, and that is a very quantitative approach. However, we've done that initial research in a controlled environment and we pass it out in the community, and we suddenly find that we're not getting the same results. So community district nurses are reporting that this new dressing that all the research proved was fantastic is not getting the results we saw in research. And it's very difficult out in the community then to find out why that is. So this is when qualitative research can support quantitative research. So you could get a, a qualitative researcher to go around and take a sample of those patients using it, which don't appear to be having the good results. 
and do semi-structured interview and ask them about their experience with the dressing, uh, how have they found using it. When the researcher conducts this research, themes start to develop. And these themes could be things like, although the doctor advised me to deliver the dressing, it left a funny smell with my wound, which could be the healing. And I was very conscious of that, so I, I stopped using the dressing. And I only put it on when I went to bed because I didn't want to smell when I was at work in the day. So then that brings up a compliance issue that we wouldn't have found out from quantitative research in a controlled environment, but it's the practical application in the real world that stops it benefiting to the level. So when this researcher gathers these themes, and a lot of patients report this, that the dressing causes a smell, and therefore a lot of them have either stopped using it or only using it when they go to bed, then this is research that quantitative research would have never known because it would have just measured outcomes, whereby interviewing these people and getting that qualitative approach, we learn a lot more. And this is where I think they sit hand in hand. Quantitative research can provide hard facts and science, but qualitative research can support that. And again, we calculate, conclude, and publish with quantitative, but in qualitative, we gather themes, we'd conclude, and we'd publish the same, both very valuable. So, only a couple more slides to go. The levels of evidence. Um, I'm not going to talk about the levels of evidence in qualitative research. I'm very much going to focus on the quantitative research now. And when we talk about levels of evidence, people, this is when people really get on their high horses and, and, and suggest that because a study is of low level evidence, we shouldn't implement change. So the levels of energy, uh, the highest level of uh, evidence is deemed as meta-analysis. That's where they take all the available randomized controlled trials, they put them all together, and they see what the overall effect of those randomized controlled trials. So this is the godfather of quantitative research. Systematic reviews often sit just a little bit below that, um, and these are systematic reviews that look at all, you know, systematically look at the evidence available. It can be inclusive of just randomized controlled trials, then it tends to be more meta-analysis, or it could include other evidence. Within that, we have synthesis, so we've got clinical guidelines. We have the experimental stuff, so the traditional ones that I think most people are in, the RCT, the randomized controlled trial. This is where we put patients into group A or group B, we control all the other variables, and we get results on one variable. And, and this is what sometimes people call, refer to as level one and level two evidence. And a lot of people won't instigate, consider practice change if we don't have this. We then start sliding down the scale of case control studies, uh, cohort studies, uh, case series, and things like that. These are lower level uh, evidence. Um, and it's, it's not insignificant evidence, but it's in, the, in the scientific community, it's not seen as, as great a quality. When often you get a series of case studies that suggest something's good or something's bad, people often dismiss it because it's not been randomized. I think a good example of this is the debate around the cervical collar at the moment. I'm a non-cervical collar user, personally, because um, I've assessed what I feel is the evidence available, and there's some other people assess the evidence available uh, better than I would have done, and they've published their systematic reviews. And depending on the, the environment, a collar is, is not needed uh, or is not of benefit and has risk. However, the people who are against cervical collars quite rightly point out and say, look, that argument is flawed. There is no level one evidence or level two evidence supporting the use of not using collars. There's been no big randomized control trials. There's been little experiments, small experiments to prove it can raise intracranial pressure. There's been experiments and research to prove in biomechanical studies that your motion is no better or worse and things like that. But it's not a randomized controlled trial. We've not randomized 1,000 patients or 5,000 patients who would have been cervically immobilized and said, half of that group are just going to be left without a collar, the other half are going to get a collar, and we'll measure the outcome of that. It's a very, that would be a very difficult pre-hospital study to do, but those who are against it won't budge on the evidence. But on the other side of the coin, there's no actual level one, level two evidence to support the use of cervical collars. So it's in these kind of environments that I think sometimes we get a little bit tied up on levels of evidence, and we fear change in practice, or we default to say more research is needed, and more research is often needed, certainly more research, pre-hospital research is needed. And that's when people often hide, well I, well, I use the term hide behind the lack of evidence or hide behind the levels of evidence. I'm not saying we should accept poor quality evidence when there's better quality evidence available, but in a dynamic practice setting, whether it be pre-hospital care, whether it be you're a hospital-based practitioner, 
you've got to approach that evidence with uh, with a little bit of common sense. So that was just a quick snapshot of the levels of evidence. So there's just a few of the references I've used within the uh, the um, presentation this evening. Uh, Andy, Andy always makes these things available, um, and I, I'll make sure you can send this out if anybody wants it. Um, and I will uh, open it up to Andy and take some questions. Thanks so much indeed, Andy. Because we're very confusing with all these Andys, isn't it? Very popular in the uh, in the ambulance service. Um, I'm just seeing lots of Mars questions at the moment, and all that talk of chocolate made me run downstairs and get myself a bar. Um, and so I'm not sure it was the healthiest thing to do. So if you have any questions for Andy, um, you can either tap into the box and we will indeed um, read them out. Or if you would like to ask Andy a question live, what we can do is if you bob your hand up, so you should see a little icon on your screen where you can pop your hand up. If you bob your hand up, I will then indeed open up your microphone uh, and um, let you ask Andy a question. So if you want to ask him a question live, just simply press a little hand icon, put your hand up, and I will then unlock your microphone and invite you to speak to uh, Andy live. Looks like we've got a hand up there, Mike. Uh, Mike. Uh, Andy. <laughs> we have indeed. I'm just going to try and uh, unlock. Yasmin, can you hear us? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Yasmin. Oh, lovely, lovely. I was just going to... Wondering, uh, ask, well, did I? Oh, I feel a bit embarrassed now. Ethics. Does all research have to go through some sort of ethics committee? Okay. Or ethics board? Yes, Yasmin. Yes. What we'll do is Andy will probably mute you now just so we don't get too much into figures and I'll answer that question. But it's a really good question, Yasmin. So, ethics. E ethics. Again, this is just touching on research tonight, so I can't answer all the things, but yes. So, if you're doing a research that um, involves subjects, so participants for want of a better word, then yes, it has to go through an ethics board. Now there's there's certain ways of getting, not getting around this, that is totally the wrong word, and I, please strike that from the <laughs> record, Andy, because it's been recorded. But um, if you're going to do any human trials, then yes, you have to go through national ethics if it involves patients, and that is quite a, a significant, prolonged and complicated process. Um, if you're doing research, for example, as part of your master's degree, um, you might just have to go through the University Ethics Committee um, and with, within different organisations you might have to go through local ethical processes but any research that is large scale like the big paramedic trials or drug trials then they, they go through huge ethical approval and quite rightly so. Gone are the days of, of Nazi Germany and things like that where we can just experiment on people at will without any, any comeback and, and ethics is a, plays a key part. However, there's some types of research, um, and this is where I've got to be careful with the word and how I do it on here, where you, de you don't necessarily need full ethics approval. So, for example, you may conduct a service evaluation, and this happens a lot. Um, within my master's research, I, I use the service evaluation method just to, to make it a little bit easier. Um, and, for example, if an ambulance service or, a, or an NHS organization is trialing a new bit of equipment, they might use that as a service evaluation. Um, and that might just need a little bit of local ethical approval to ensure it's not going to cause harm. But if it's just evaluating a piece of equipment and it's not going to, it's not something new or in an innovative treatment that's going to directly affect a patient, then you wouldn't necessarily need the level of ethics. Um, but yeah, ethics. If you were going to endeavour on a research project, um, and I, I, and I've I've had this experience myself, the thing that will always slow you down, catch you out, and cause you the biggest headache is ethics. Um, the people who sit on these ethic committees, um, probably quite rightly for patient safety, are quite strict, um, very robust in their analysis, and they will pull your research proposals to pieces on the ethical grounds. And that should be how it is. It shouldn't be easy to get ethical approval because <coughs> patients are, are at the forefront. Does this detract and discourage people from conducting potentially good research? Of course it does, um, but it doesn't mean it should go away. So, yeah, ethics is definitely for research. And research involving humans is always absolutely required. I hope that answers the question. <coughs> Does that answer Thank your you. question? Thank you, yes. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Cheers, yes. Jasmine. Thanks. Okay, we have another question for you. Um, <laughs> the next question is, what is the best length of time or minimum time that is recommended to research? And that's from Angela. Angela, good question. How long is a piece of string? Um, research time, um, it's not generally over a period of time research needs to be conducted. It's research time is normally defined by the numbers of 
the sample size you need to achieve, um, and that often uh, is you know what defines the research. So to get we're in research, I, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's about creating power values. And prior to research being conducted, you'll decide what level of effect you want the research to have to prove your concept. And again, this is where the clever statisticians come in. They'll work out power values if you want 80% power, 95% power, whatever it may be. And they, they will then say to achieve a significant result, you're going to have to include 3,600 patients into both control groups, for example. Um, that might be less, that might be more. Um, and depending on what you're researching will define the time. So recently in, in the area of practice I, I work in over here in the northeast, there's a study going on called the, um, the uh, pasta study. Um, it's not studying how flavoursome pasta is, it's a study into stroke care and it's a new assessment for pre-hospital stroke to define whether somebody is bleeding or potentially has a block and how quickly that will define whether they go to thrombolysis and CT scan. And they've brought that into paramedic pre-hospital practice and looked at whether this is effective. Um, they've got two years to, because um, of finance and everything else, to do that study. Um, from what I was being informed about this study the other day, um, and they need to recruit something like 1,500 patients. Um, and therefore, they may recruit that patients in 18 months, and that would be the end of the study. Um, or it may actually come to the two-year point. They've not got enough patients. They might have to extend the study. What you shouldn't do with research, and unfortunately, because of time and money constraints this can happen, is define the research by a specific length of time. For example, one of the criticisms of the CRASH-2 trials, which was looking at transamic acid use in trauma, was that the trial it had a proven benefit, yet continued to randomize patients after that proven benefit was found, and that there was a lot of patients then, once we had enough data and evidence to prove that um, it worked, there was a lot of patients continued to be randomized into the control group whose treatment would have been better off in the treatment group and that that you know could be deemed that could be deemed for example unethical so on big pre research projects they're getting regularly reviewed and once something if something is found to be harmful the research would be stopped or if something is found to be of benefit and we've got the numbers we need and the proof the evidence is there through statistical analysis then there would be no need to recruit additional patients into that research so it really is a piece of string question and i hope that gives you a bit of an idea of um of how research length is defined. It's, no, it's normally on the need rather than a specific length. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I think that's answered all questions. Uh, but again, if you do have any questions and um, the webinar is over tonight, then don't worry. We can get the questions answered for you. Just simply either email myself or you can indeed email Andy Thomas. Okay, so before we go any further, I shall just tell you what is coming up soon. Um, as I said, I've had a couple of questions in relation to what happens to the certificate. The certificate will come out to you automatically within 24 hours. The system will analyse how attentive you've been to the webinar, and then that will be issued out to you via email. And if you are a CPD member, as I said, it will automatically drop into your profile. So it'll drop into your dashboard where you can edit and amend what you've learnt from tonight's webinar. Uh, just some more webinars coming up shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. The 22nd of June, we have uh, Amanda Mansfield, who's a consultant midwife. who will be talking about breech birth. Uh, what I do know is that there is not very many spaces left on that webinar. Uh, I, I think there was about six or seven last time I looked, but that could have been last time, last month. So it might be worthwhile having a look at that now on CPDME. Uh, the next one is a brand new um, presenter, uh, a gentleman called Paul Gowans, who's a consultant paramedic, and he's going to be talking about professionalism at Walking the Walk, and that is a webinar on the 13th of July at half past seven. And again, Amanda's back on the 27th of July uh, talking about uh, cord prolapses. Uh, we have got some more webinars coming shortly, but if you do want to keep up to date and find out what is happening, you can either follow us on Twitter or on Facebook, or indeed just Google search CPDME webinar and you'll be able to see them and the list of up and coming webinars to book onto. Uh, all that leaves me to say is thank you very much to Andy Thomas for this evening. And I know he was in a super rush all the way down from up north to his uh, home address to present this tonight. So thanks, Andy. Yeah, no worries, mate. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much indeed for taking part. And uh, take it easy and good night. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. Uh, um, and thank you to everyone who attended this evening. Um, and good night and enjoy your evening. Many thanks. <laughs>